Jim Hanover Country Club, which is Dartmouth's golf course, and Pine Park. Our speakers will talk for about 20 minutes each, and then they will take questions. They both have PowerPoints to illustrate their points. Keith Clinton has been in Hanover for summers since the 1960s, and has been a resident since 1989. He and his lovely wife, Barbara, have their children in Hanover High, too. He is a Dartmouth College and Tuck School of Business graduate, as well as a local historian and avid golfer. So he's going to start us off explaining the golf history. Keith. Thank you, Cindy. Everybody hear me OK? Back row, hear me OK? Great. So I am not a historian by training. I am a, uh, not even a golfer by training. But my, my goal tonight is to entertain you, give you some cool old maps and photos, and give you a few fun facts about the course, and give you a sense of the place. I have 120 slides. We're going, we're going to go fast. Then Linda's going to go, and then we're going to do questions. So the course started in 1896. There's a rough nine hole course was laid out. In 1897, it got expanded temporarily to 18 holes. The official beginning we think of as being 1899, when they bought a field and built a permanent nine holes, established as a corporation. 1914, the college bought the course for $12,000. 1918 to 1921, it kind of expanded, built the bridge. In the 1930s, it was a nine-hole practice course. That's the kind of the rough layout for the first half of the 1900s. This is the original, not the original, this is a copy of the original incorporation. Um, it was signed June 19th, 1899. Um, you'll see a bunch of, over here on the, um, I can actually point. Over here, we'll see later are the original founders. Local names you'll recognize well. The objective of the club shall be the cultivation of outdoor recreation and the promotion of social interaction amongst its members. And this is a copy from the New Hampshire State um, Secretary of State's office. Uh, September 1899, the Sunday Boston Herald had an article that um, front page of, I think, the sports section talks about Dartmouth's wise men love the game. And it goes into detail. It says, apparently, everybody in Hanover either played golf or talked about golf in 1899. There's a very nice description here of the original course layout and the original members. Um, again, a lot of names you'll recognize. Um, it talks about having tennis, golf, and skeet shooting, and then skiing and tobogganing in the winter. So it was a year-round kind of spot to be. Here's an old picture, a postcard of the course. We're on the uh, west side of Occam Pond, kind of looking northeast. So you can kind of, there's a green out there. And the original course was laid out along here on the, let me get the right description of this. The west, the, um, sorry, it's the west side of Stump Lane. And I didn't know that Stump Lane was the early name for Rope Ferry Road. So. <laughs> because there were pine trees over there that they used, the blacksmiths used to, I think, do wrought iron casting and blacksmithing. When they would clear fields, they yep. would take the stumps and line them up along the edge of the field as a fence to keep livestock or okay. other boundary. Great. Stump fence. Thank you. There's a photograph of that somewhere in one of Jay Barrett's calendars. Okay. So basically, 1901, these are the first um, uh, rules of the course and the uh, describes things like you have the right to play at your own pace deliberately and without having to give part of your attention to the dodging of golf balls, which is nice. The sumacs will not be bent or broken, so apparently there was sumacs all over the course, and no Sunday playing was allowed. There was no Sundays. Yep, so it was the original property or tower, Powers and Ruggles was the lots on the west side of Stump Lane. Oops. 
They are the original incorporators I was talking about. Names like, um, sorry, I'll get to the right page here. So it's Charles Richardson, William Tucker, those kind of people that you will recognize from early history in Hanover. $12 was the annual membership. You could play for $3 for the month. 1905, you start to see it showing up on maps. So there's the Country Club Golf up there on the end of Old Ferry Road. 1906 USGS map, it's not there yet, but the course kind of runs around there. Girl Brook shows up in the old Rope Ferry Road going out to where the Rope Ferry was across to Norwich. 1910, but I think it's later, it's the layout of the course, much closer to where it is now, but it's a picture that's labeled 1910, but I think it's later, because it's the layout of the course, much closer to where it is now, but it's a neat old picture. And now we get to the first really cool map. So to orient you, that's Occam Pond. Used to be called Faculty Pond. So the DOC house is kind of there. The clubhouse is kind of there. But you see, this is where the course ran, out there and back. The first tee box is right there. And you went down, played up around the hill, and looped back. If you look over here on the left near the pond, you see tennis courts laid out. And that's Professor Proctor's house and Professor Key's house. So I did not know that the course was there originally. It's a very nice description of it. And um, uh, I think we're going to try and figure out, Roger Demon's going to try and map the course layout from the description to the holes. You can see them up, there's a tee box there, there's a green there, another green up there. So, but it runs right down along the side of the, uh, of Occam Pond. If you try and kind of superimpose that on today's picture, so that's today. So I think the tennis courts are right about there. And the first tee box is right about there. So. So in 1915, Henry Hilton, class of 90 from Dartmouth, a Dartmouth trustee, donated the money to buy the, buy the course to the college in 1915, and it became named Hilton Field. And you still, to this day, that road is Hilton Field Road that goes from Rope Ferry over to Ockham Ridge. In 1930, he donated another $48,000 to expand the course across the veil, to t the veil of to Tomp, I think Tempe, I think it's called. 1917, the price had gone up to $20 to play for a year. And there were lockers in the course at that point. Here's an old original scorecard. It's the nine hole course. So you can see the old, great old names of the course, things like uh, the Well, Birches, Big Pine, Valley, Sumax, Ridge, Elbow, Old Cellar, and Home. But that was the original course layout. We have some more early scorecards here, local rules, things like um, penalty for out of bounds or lost ball is loss of distance only. That's not an official USGA rule, but it's certainly the rule we still play to this day. Um, on 14, there used to be a lot of, there was a log on the hillside there, log wall. You could get, move your ball from there and play your second shot. Oops. So 1912, this map's labeled, again, this is the, to orient you, that's Faculty Pond or Occam Pond. That's the old Rope Ferry Road going across the course out to the Connecticut River. Here is the, what was then the Hitchcock Estate which I know Linda's going to talk about because that was donated to the um, uh, Pine Park Association. And that's Girl Brook running right through it. In some pictures you'll see it's labeled um, Potash Brook. And the in next interesting factoid is the second half of the Hitchcock Estate donation was this piece of property, which is in fact where Tuck is now. So there's Webster Avenue. There's the Connecticut River, and there's the cemetery. So that whole area there was the second half of the Hitchcock Estate donation to the college. In 
around 1920, um, Robert Fletcher and his Tuck and his Thayer students um, did a survey of the course and of the uh, Pine Park area. Now it's really hard to see. To orient you, that's the Vale of Tempe, so that's where the Girl Brook runs. Connecticut River's over there, Ockham Pond is here, the clubhouse is there. And this was a nine hole course that I never found a lot of descriptions for. Basically, it's, it's the current course over here. You went across the Vale of Tempe, but there were three holes over here on the far side. So there was six, seven, I'm sorry, six, seven, eight there, and you came back to play nine back down here. So there's, but there's no bridge. So that would have been quite an adventure going from there to there. So the orange area is the old, is the uh, Hitchcock estate that was donated to Pine Park. The same survey shows a couple of different looks at, um, at Pine Park here. Nineteen twenty-five, we had um, Glenna Collette, top left, was a uh, her brother was a Dartmouth uh, twenty-nine, and she showed up on campus. She had won the um, U.S. Amateur the year before, or the Canadian Amateur the year before, came up and played, and I think a couple of fun things. One is she's got high heels on, which is quite a nice way to play golf. Two is this. That line you can't read, it says, the golf team wants co-education at Hanover. So, and there is the golf team right there. She apparently won the match though, so. There's some of the things Glenna Collette did. Now we start, we're up on, now we're out on Lime Road. That's Reservoir Road there, there's the Garapay Farm. We're up on the ski jump looking out and given, compared to today, no pine trees. I know a lot of players that would appreciate that layout. And um, this is before Lime Road got um, built up by the state. There's some more detail on the Garipay farm. I've talked to Charlie Garipay about this. You can see a lot of the old pictures right there on Reservoir Road. That's kind of where the um, rugby house is now. So they did build a bridge. This is the bridge across the Vale of Tempe. That's the uh, 18th tee box coming back. In 1933, they built a second nine-hole course, which is, um, you, that's Lime Road to orient you. That's coming through the Vale of Tempe and up kind of along where the maintenance shacks are now and um, sort of where you drive through to get over to the 17. Um, there was so much demand for golf, there were people were having to wait, so they built the second course and Barton was the designer of it. But it kind of went one, two, three, and four. Seven is the hole that I've been told was beautifully laid out, that's eight, and then nine is back there coming down. This doesn't exist, these holes still exist now, over here, but these are all gone. When the state built up route, this Route 10, it was decided that it was too dangerous to cross over and back to play. It's a nice nine hole course, the, nine, the description of the nine hole course in the alumni magazine. Picture of Tommy Keene there. I grabbed the white pine blister rust maps for the area. They're, if you haven't seen those, they're fascinating for the more rural parts of Hanover. They're not particularly fascinating for this part of Hanover. More pictures from a 1933 photo album. That's the third green. That's the clubhouse. That's Hilton Field Road. So these trees are, um, I think they've gone and been replaced. This is looking down towards the fifth green, which is down there. Now, 
1938, with the hope of encouraging a greater use of the golf course by women, the Board of Governors of the Hanover Country Club has established a new low annual fee of $15 for the women of the community. So they were trying to get more women to play. So my next cool map. So this is the layout minus one. So the last renovation changed some of these holes, but if you, that's the clubhouse there. That's one going out, two back, three up the hill, short number four, number five down the hill, six goes across the ravine, the old layout, straight up the hill. You walk around to play seven down along Lime Road. Now it's where it gets interesting. So there's this whole area blocked out there, which I never knew about. That's actually, there's a house there, a couple of buildings. So you, and the clearly it was not part of the college's course because the course was built around it. There's what they called eight is now um, uh, seven for us. And then here's number nine. Now the pond is there, now the green is there, but in this day, since they didn't own that land, the nine green is up on top of the hill. To make the hole long enough, they moved the tee box back over to the woods. Doesn't sound too bad until you realize the people that are playing 11 are teeing off right over your head. So, <laughs> so that's not good. 10 is also shorter down there on the edge. And then um, it goes, this is the old layout minus one, as I said, so 15 is a little shorter to there, 16's there, 17's down the hill, and 18 back across the ravine. But this is the cool thing, I've, this is the coolest thing I found. You can't see it over there, so I'm gonna blow up that section, but if you move to Hanover after 1993, you may not know that there was a ski jump out on the course that I'll show you in a minute, but what I didn't know was there was a second ski jump right there. So there's an old ski jump in the woods and there's an old toboggan slide right next to it. So that's the fifth green, still the fifth green today. That's the sixth tee box across the bridge. But this toboggan slide and this old ski jump. That was there when I was a kid at Chuck. Really? Yeah. Very cool. I, it's, it's, I didn't know, no one, you're the first person I knew that actually knew about it. So if we try and kind of look in the woods, we're talking about kind of down there. And now if I, I threw some contour lines in, I think probably the contour line is right through there, one the ski jump. And here it is on a second map showing the second ski jump over there, the, new, the one we all know about there, the old one over there. It was a 15 meter ski jump. So as then suddenly a picture that I'd found in Jay Barrett's collection made a whole lot more sense because this is described as the toboggan slide and ski jump and we couldn't figure out where it was. But I think what we are is we're looking back at the ski jump and the toboggan slide side by side there. And um, you can see the crowds probably from either Winter Carnival or some event like that. So now suddenly it all comes together. Early letter from Bill Johnson, who was the pro when I learned to play golf here. Four dollars, it looks like a tournament letter of some kind. Four dollars for caddies. And if you wanted food, he sent you down to the red door, which is across from the super duper. Now I don't know where those things are. I'm gonna guess that's where the CVS is now. But um, it's a guess, yeah. Oops. So now we get to the ski jump, 1948 picture of the ski jump. Picture from the ski jump in 1948, looking again out towards Reservoir Road, Garapé Farm. That was built since the last picture. Sadly, the pine trees have been planted and are growing <laughs> between all the fairways here, so. They're much taller now. That's right, someone just mentioned, that's Oak Hill out there. That was the ski area. Some promotional material, the course and the um, outing club, DOC house used to have a closer relationship. In fact, I think the lockers were on the second floor of the DOC house and you could eat downstairs in the summer. 
So now we get to some of the files I found over at Rawner. I'll just mention to you, if you want to get someone to read your files 61 years lab la later, label them confidential, because those were the files I read, because they were, they were. You know. <laughs> this file labeled confidential. So the discussion at the Hanover Inn would take over the golf course and um, uh, run it. Some other good quotes, replace the clubhouse or drastically overhaul it. That was 1957, 61 years ago. <laughs> and just so we don't feel out of place, there were operating losses of $7,000, $10,000, and $11,000 in the mid-50s. 1963. We are not moving too fast on major expenditures in the clubhouse as we are giving consideration to other locations for a clubhouse. Uh -huh. 1963. These are trustee votes. 1964, it was therefore the sense of the committee that the 18 and nine hole golf courses should not be redeveloped in their present location and the board concurred. They hired an architect to re relocate all or a portion of the course and use the course for educational, motel or clubhouse purposes or um, commercial property. So then the, the course, the architect came back with a new location for the Hanover Inn. So it looks like they were going to move, propose to move the Hanover Inn up next to the golf course and combine the two operations. The combination of the inn with the golf course makes a very attractive package. And the plan freed up the, the six holes on the west side of Vail de Tom. 1965, one of the college's principal difficulties in this long-range planning is that it cannot even consider a proposal for something specific without rumors leaking out, which are sometimes wholly incorrect and sometimes only partially correct. <laughs> so that goes in the category of what changes does not, some things never change. The only thing that's been done is to decide we will not spend money to improve the present golf course in its present location. Beyond that, everything is completely open. That's 1965. So 1967, they were talking about moving the course again because the golf course at present is not really a very good golf course. We get constant complaining about how physically tiring it is to play the golf course, especially the three holes on the 18-hole course at the foot of the ski jump. That's true today. That could be me today talking about this course. 1967, they talked about not letting win, women tee off between 11 and 2 on Wednesdays and on Saturdays. Decided not to instigate any such rule. They also talked about boys selling golf balls on the bridge that they had found. I remember that even in the 80s. That was very convenient because you could hit a golf ball in the ravine and buy it back from the kids on the way back. <laughs> the 1970s, the town had aerial surveys taken, aerial photographs taken. They actually used them for mapping and such. This, just already, so that's the Connecticut River in the front. That's Girl Brook, or Girl Brook outlets. So if you look up there, that's the old number 12 hole, and 13 is going down that away, and the ski jump's kind of up there. This is a look at the, hole, at the course, the practice holes on the other side of Lime Road, the four holes there, and um, at the top is where the driving range is now. So Lime Road is over there. This is looking down. That's the, where the fire station is now. That's the current 10th um, hole. This is the, the old 11th hole. That's the tw old 12th hole over to there, 13. So you can see the ski jump still there. And right there on the hillside, you can see all these things that look like kind of rivels or like little paths. 
That's actually where people stood to watch the ski jumpers come up and down the hill. And we'll have some pictures of that in a minute. More pictures of the old practice course. That's Lime Road. So that's the four holes that are still remaining. I think this must be the old nine hole, the first part of the nine hole course. And I think if you look at the map, and I was talking to Roger Demon, I think that's probably nine coming back there because it had a dog leg right. Yes. Is that correct? Thanks. More pictures of the practice holes. So now you can see the pond. So that's the old um, seventh hole. And that's, that's the adventurous tenth hole, which we'll read about later. You can see where the green is and where the road is. They're very close. And that creates a controversy in the 80s. Now we're back on the front part of the course. That's Occam Pond. That's the clubhouse. So you get the sense there are a lot fewer trees. So. Oh, so there you can see the, that's much more of the front hole. So I think the map I have shows the first tee box kind of over here going out through Vale of Tempe. It was closed in the 70s. So 73 discussions of where to move the property. So one of them is to the former Archer Hudson land, which I think was just recently donated to conservation by the college. And the other is the so-called Rene land in Hanover Center. And we all know what's going on the Rene farms right now. So it was proposed to move the golf course up there. 1973, there was a bridge on number 12 they considered closing. Do you remember that bridge, the bridge on number 12? Because I don't, I can't think of it where a bridge on number 12 would be. Yeah? Just because it, because the tee box was behind 11, right. straight out, yeah. and down in the valley, just. Yeah. There was a bridge for the nine hole course. It was, it was closer to the clubhouse. I think I have, a, I have a picture of that we'll get to. But even on 12, there was a bridge over there. So I, on three, also. three. Oh yeah, across the ravine there. They filled that in, I think. 1974, I believe it was seven or eight years ago that a wealthy alumnus interested in golf financed a study for rebuilding the present golf course. The plans were elaborate and included a large new clubhouse on the Lime Road. Just goes around, comes around. So the Hudson land is mentioned, and the beautiful Rene Farms land. Beautiful piece, hilly, meadow, and farmland back then. Again, in the Some Things Never Changed, 1975, joggers on the course continue to be a problem. That's a problem today. And the second sentence I like very much. The member's alcoholic beverage situation apparently is a problem. <laughs> There's so much meaning in that sentence. Nineteen seventy seven, the golf course people were mad at the ski jump people, and they were asking that the vehicles not be parked on greens, tees, or fairways. This was the fourteenth green that was rebuilt, I think, in seventy seven. Nineteen eighty four we have it now costs four hundred and eighty five dollars for a family membership. Nineteen eighty seven it's up to six hundred dollars. Then we get to the controversy in nineteen eighty seven when the college rerouted the course because of complaints of golf balls on Lime Road. The members were outraged. Number seven went from a par four to a par three, and the tenth hole was temporarily shut down, and I think they put, ultimately put a screen up there. But someone wrote, golf balls have been hitting cars on Lime Road since the automobile was invented. 
And John Manchester, who I still play golf with up here, reports broken glass at the gas station. He had a gas station right on the corner of Lime and Reservoir. And two or three golf balls a day would apparently go through his parking lot. Nineteen ninety-eight, we're up to thirteen hundred dollars, fourteen hundred dollars to be a member. David Cornwell, a local golf historian, wrote an article in nineteen ninety-nine um, about the course. It's a great history. We have, a, I have a copy of it. If anyone wants to read it, it's a, it's a real historical piece. This was the tournament they sponsored in uh, nineteen ninety-nine to celebrate the hundred hundred years of golf in Hanover. Two thousand six. It's a very young picture of Alex Kirk. This is the picture I think we're talking about. This is the bridge. So now we're getting to out of sequence pictures. This is a bridge, a rope bridge, coming back from the ninth green, back across the Vale of Tempe, back to the clubhouse. There's some fun old memorabilia you find, either in the files or online. That's, those are tobacco silks on the left. You get them in tobacco um, cartons. And then there's some note cards on the right. No idea where this bridge is. There's a sign on the left there that labels it Park Bridge. Came out of the golf files. 1938 hurricane, took down a ton of trees. That's the ski jump. So that's the 15th fairway. That building, I think, is still here. I think I've hit golf balls off that building. So. Now we're back on the front part of the course. That's the fourth tee box. So just to frame you, that's Baker, that's the power station, that's the clubhouse. This is now a much more elongated um, tee box. And again, the trees are much smaller. That's the bridge I think you were talking about maybe on the old ninth hole. That's the ski jump over there. So the only way I can see this, this must be on the old, the old nine old course across the street. I was thinking of the rope bridge. Oh, the rope bridge, okay. More old scorecards with local rules. Another old scorecard. This is the original nine hole course. The right pay for caddies is 10 cents. More old scorecards. You can tell when the course, what era they're from. If the seventh hole in this layout is a par four, it's from before 1987. And then the 17th was a par three on the old layout. Another scorecard, you can't read it. Across the bottom it says, this card measures six inches when opened. Does anybody know why the course would be mentioned six inches when it's opened? Give me. Give me. Uh, no, stymie rule. It's the stymie measure. You didn't mark your golf balls, and they were so you had to putt around people or chip over them. And then there was finally they invented a stymie rule, which was if you were within six inches, you could ask the person to mark, and you'd have to. So. Again, this is Bill Johnson was the pro for a long time here. This is the current minus one layout. You could be invited to join the club back in the old days. You'd get a bid and be invited to join. So you can tell this is a later scorecard because the seventh hole is a par three. Rule I like, courtesy is the golden rule. It's published right there on the, on the scorecard. And standard round is three and a half hours, which I'm hardly in favor of. This is an older layout. This is the, th the 13th green. Nowadays, it's kind of more over this way. Way up there, you can't see in this picture, there's a, the 12th green up there. You can see a f there's a flag in the 12th green. This is the 18th tee box going back. There's the bridge, a couple of shots of that. See a screen here? Could use that screen today. That's six going over. So that's the six going over to the old six fairway. There's the bridge. Steep drop. 
our favorite clubhouse. Originally, it was called the Golf Barn. It literally was a barn that got moved there. Um, you can see on the right-hand side there, I can't see, but there's a cat. There's the, now it's the restaurant, was the caddy shack they built for the caddies to hang out in. Some more old pictures of the course. No trees. That's Rope Ferry Road going around there and out. More clubhouse. That's the first. I think that's the first tee box going out that way. More old clubhouse pictures. Nice old postcard. More clubhouse. So now we're out on the fairway looking back up. This is the Rope Ferry Road going across the course. There's the clubhouse. I think that makes that 18, and that's one and two. Here's a picture. I think this is the tee box on the ninth hole, and that's Baker Library over there. So Lime Road is kind of behind the person taking the picture. Talks about this sign, access of the ice near the ice house to the skiway. So I'm wondering if that old house we saw before was an ice house at one point. Now we're up on top of the hill, the third green. That's the Baker Library. That's the power station. So the clubhouse is there. That's the third green. More third green. Town Bicentennial map shows the old 18 and the nine hole course. Now we're over Occam Pond looking north. So the clubhouse is there. Nineteen eighty eight, Jack Nicholas's company did a proposed redesign of the course. The biggest changes are here. This is the third tee box, and it was proposed basically to take out where the third green is and play all the way to the fourth green and make it a par five instead of a par four. You have the normal par three down there. You got rid of the crossing tee boxes by making the next hole there going up. Then this hole got moved away from the uh, road as did this hole. And in fact, this is very close to the current layout. That green got moved. Two thousand one is the most recent renovation. Robert Keeler donated the money for that. Four holes were replaced, eleven, twelve, sixteen, and seventeen. Seven hundred yards were added to the course. That's the way it exists today. So there you see the current layout. That's Lime Road. Clubhouse is right in there. There's a picture, picture of it. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that in the woods over there near the 12th tee box, it's where the med school buried their cadaver ashes for many years. So you, if you go in there, you find little crosses. Famous golfers, Hanover Woodrow Wilson played it a bunch of times. Glenna Collette I mentioned, Francis We Met, Gene Sarazen, Babe Ruth, Dwight Eisenhower played before he gave the commencement lecture, Jackie Robinson, and Jack Nicholas. Quick ski history. The golf course has a lot of ski history as well. The first slalom race was laid out in 1925, and the big old ski jump up on Lime Row was built as well in 1925. 1910. You have a mention of ski jumping, so I'm assuming this is the old ski jump that I found in the woods. I love this picture for many reasons. One is who, who doesn't like ski joring? Getting on skis behind a horse, that can't be bad. But it's the old, it's the old town, this is the green. So there's, that's the north side, so Baker Library's not built yet. So it's skiing on, behind a horse up North Main Street. And um, you can't read it, but that sign actually says the preliminary carnival meet is Saturday at 2 p.m. on the golf links. I don't know what this is. It looks like an old starting ramp of some kind. 
This is a picture of the ski jump. So you're up on the 14th green right here looking back. That's the ski jump coming down. Just crowds and crowds of people. That's the 13th green is over there now. There's the same picture colorized in a postcard dated 1934. That's the third green up there, so looking up the hill. 48, the ski jump coming down. Postcard describing the children's ski school. Again, that's the top, that's the hill going up to three. And there's another shot of it. A couple more. So now we get to the rope toe that I remember as a kid going up there. Rope toe went up to the top of between, sort of between three green and four T. That's sort of the highest point there. You can find an old, po there's actually an old post still behind the green on number three. There's a men's ski team at Dartmouth. A 1970s ski meet, but not a lot of snow, but that's the third green up there. So now we're up on the hill looking back down. Baker Power Station Clubhouse. Two buildings out there, which I have no re memory of. Don't know what they are. Portable rope tow. Going up the mountain. Some online history of the uh, ski jump. Local historians, I recommend this website. That is the New England Lost Ski Area Project. Talks about the country club, some good local quotes. Amazing number of old ski resorts here in the, in the state. So for a real history, in 1999, David Cornwall did this book, 100 Years of Birdies and Bogies. It's a real history of the course. You can find some information at the alumni magazine about the wildlife found in the course. And basically, I want to thank everyone, the Warner Collection, David Cornwell, Mike Hinsley, Jay Barrett, Town of Hanover, State Records, Roger Demon gave me a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to keep going on this. I want to go find that ski jump in the woods. There are more Warner boxes labeled confidential that I want to go through. <laughs> Roger gave me some files. Hanover Gazette, the Daily D are mentioned as sources. Aegis yearbooks, um, Valley News. I can geo-reference the maps and overlay them all together so we can figure out where everything is. And then there's town property records. So I'm gonna stop there, turn over to Linda. I'm wired, can you all hear what I'm wearing? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I just wanna thank the Historical Society uh, when the college announced that it was uh, looking seriously at options for the golf course, I think there was a lot of panic uh, in the community. And I know when Cindy and I talked, I said, tell everybody to calm down. Pine Park is a bigger factor in this decision than anybody might think. Um, and that's, of course, because most people in Hanover think that Pine Park is owned by the college, when in fact it's owned by uh, a nonprofit foundation. Um, and its history is intimately uh, connected to um, the golf course. Uh, a lot of the same names and the same dates figure in the history of both. Let me just start, for those of you who haven't been in Pine Park, um, it's um, about 91 acres, according to some accounts, 96 according to others. I first encountered Pine Park when I came to Dartmouth to run the Nelson Rockefeller Center. And um, I guess I hadn't been here very long. And it was the first snowfall in December uh, of 95. And my son, who was a student here, had been working late at Kiwit on a CS project. And he could see the light on in my office. And he came across the street and he said, Mom, get your skis. So we got our skis and we went over to Pine Park and skied in this fresh snow by moonlight at about 12 o'clock at night. And that was just one of the most magical memories I have. And of course, I've spent many, many years since then uh, uh, enjoying it. 
But in about 2005, I started to get alarmed, and that turned me into a bit of a troublemaker as far as the town and the college were concerned. Um, because like many things that come to be taken for granted, benign neglect had worked, it very, worked very well for the park for many, many years. Um, so I got interested in how it came to be, its unusual organizational history, and what we might do to um, preserve it for the next generation. Um, the trail that you see here is one of the trails that runs, it's one of the signature trails in the park that runs along the river in this very uh, large grove of white pines, some of which are over 145 feet tall. We have some of the highest pines in the state, not the tallest. But it's also, we had somebody from the Forest Society come in last fall, and he said the, the size of the woodland, uh, given the age and size of the trees, is really unprecedented. So it's quite a gem. Um, it was, um, here was an aerial photograph, and the lines in yellow um, are an overlay of Pine Park. And you can see it has lots of sort of odd uh, bumps. Um, this to get you oriented, here's the Connecticut River. Here's a little odd piece of land that was added by Mrs. Hitchcock in order to provide access from what was then Rope Ferry Road. Um, and you can see that Girl Brook kind of meanders through here before it goes out uh, to, connect, to the Connecticut River. Um, the founding, it was purchased in 1900 from Arabella Hutchinson. Uh, the original park was 45 acres, um, and the purchase price was $4,000. It ran along the Connecticut River and then up Occam Ridge. Uh, and it, the purchasers were interested in preserving the land from the Diamond Match Company, which had gone, uh, had the intention of cutting down whatever trees were there and turning them into matchsticks. Um, and so part of the uh, original 18 investors, and here are some of the names that will be familiar to Keith, um, Chase, Tuck, Colby, Lord, Tucker, Richardson, and many others. Um, they created an association after they purchased the land, and in 1905, there were articles of incorporation. And the purpose of the park was to, quote, establish and maintain a park, lay out roads and walks, and plant shade and ornamental trees, shrubs and flowers therein. It was also to secure permanently to the inhabitants of the village of Hanover improved opportunities for swimming and boating on the Connecticut River. Um, part of this project involved relocation of Rope Ferry Road, and you get some sense of that from Keith's slides. Um, and that happens in 1906 and 1907 uh, to, uh, at the southern boundary of a piece of the park. Uh, in 1912, with a bequest from Mrs. Hitchcock, she signed this bequest about three days before she died. So Hannah was very fortunate in her far-sighted generosity. Um, and that added an additional 46.5 acres to the park. Um, things, uh, as you often see with these things, uh, events have sort of happen in groups. Um, in 1913, uh, which is roughly the same time that the people who started the park, who were also involved in founding the golf course, they sold the golf, golf course to the college. But they did not sell Pine Park to the college. What they did instead was set up a joint, a, a, an agreement that conferred possession, control, and maintenance of the park to the college and the um, town. And one of the people who was to oversee the park was a, 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 an elected official, the commissioner for Pine Park. That happens to be me right now. Um, but I'm also president of the Pine Park Association. Um, and at that time, in 1913, uh, the agreement read that all acts and transactions require the consent of the approval of all the parties. What's interesting about this transaction is that there was never a deed filed. Um, and the college actually never took possession of the park in any sort of meaningful legal way. And yet many people in the college and in the town sort of assumed that they controlled the park. Um, 
At the same time, Pine Park gets uh, tax exempt status uh, from the uh, state of New Hampshire. So it's in a fairly um, uh, interesting situation. It's not clear. There's some, well, in the minds of the trustees, it's not ambiguous at all. The association owns the park, but there was a very unusual arrangement. And you have to remember, 1900, nobody was setting up conservation easements at that time. There was no IRS. There was no income tax. So all of the things that we've come to take for granted as rules regulating the use of these commonly held resources um, came much later. So the trustees were really quite farsighted, but in the end, they didn't really have the kind of legal structure that they might have wished to have um, when they created this park. So, um, uh, so 1913 is a fairly um, uh, uh, momentous time for both the golf course and the park. Um, and by this time, if you can see the map, this is a survey map from 1925. Here's the Connecticut River. This is college land. Um, and this is the old, the first Pine Park that's set up in 1900. This is a parcel that's added. So you begin to see all of this happening. Girl Brook is coming out over here. And it runs sort of through there. Um, the, this um, patch up here is the old Rope Ferry Road. It seems to have gone up kind of near the Esker. Um, and what we've been seeing as the hillside where the skiers were and if, and there's also an indication of um, the old ski jump, uh, which is right here. This be was called the, the Vale of Tempe. And I always thought the Vale of Tempe was on the other side, where, the, where the, what we think of as the old ski jump, but was really the second ski jump, is located. But in fact, the Vale is this whole bowl that's bisected by the river. So looking north, this is all wooded. This is all wooded. I think many people believe that Pine Park starts after you go um, up the little cart path um, uh, that sort of um, separates the T from the fairway. And I'm not a golfer, so I don't know what hold that is. But it's near the homes on the, on the river side of Occam Ridge. But Pine Park actually starts much farther down. You have to go down the hill. Um, and for those of you who walk in Pine Park, think about the southern boundary on that side as being where the pump house is to, park, uh, to pump water up um, for the irrigation system for the golf course. Um, so this is sort of the way things are set up. Rope Ferry Road has been moved. Um, some boundaries have been evened out. Um, two parcels have been combined into one. The trustees thought they'd created a management plan for the park um, that had joint uh, operation with the college and, um, and the town with a, 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 a commissioner and a board uh, and an a association, a nonprofit association, that was responsible for overseeing it. So that's where things stayed. You had, in 1938, just as the golf course was uh, extensively damaged, Pine Park had huge amounts of money. And you get the first sign of some of the conflicts that are possible with the trustees and the town and the college because they were dealing with their downed trees. And nobody was paying attention to the mess in Pine Park. So you have evidence of a, of a, um, a fundraising effort by the trustees to raise money from the community in order to get the down trees and restore the park so that it could be um, used once again. So, um, OK. So thinking, let me see. I have one more, wait a minute. Oh, this is, I have a slide in here for the paths. Let me just show you kind of where they are. So now we're looking, I've turned the map sideways. So here's the Connecticut River, and basically, Here's the Girlbrook circuit, and it sort of goes around through here and comes back out up onto the golf course near the road that runs along that's the extension from Rope Ferry. And this is the only 
sort of real access um, to the park. On the other side, the people who use the park have always prevailed upon the custom and using the old Rope Ferry Road, but in fact, it's college land that they're on. So this is the Esker Trail, and um, here's the Vale of Tempe down, uh, down here. You can see some of it is belongs to the golf course, some of it belongs to the college. Here's the Cathedral Isle, which is at the bottom of the steep Esker on the riverside. And then this Esker Trail runs along what I think is the old Rope Ferry Road, the before it was relocated. OK, so um, you have a flowage agreement between the Pine Park Association and the Bellows Falls Hydroelectric Company, um, which flooded um, the western uh, part of the park, um, which we've been told must have been farmed it someday. We had an ecologist in there a couple of years ago. And he basically said he knew it had been farmed, the banks, the area along the river, because if it hadn't been, you would have something called pillows and Laura, what's the? Pillows. Pillows and cradles. The pillows being when the roots of big trees come up, they create a lump and the cradles are where the roots were. And that woods has no pillows and cradles in it. So it must have been farmed at some point before it became um, a, a, a beautiful pine forest. Um, it's also the case that um, uh, thinking about um, other things that happened, the town of Hanover in 1961 had plans to build a sewage treatment plant in Pine Park. Um, they had already put sewers, and there was an agreement uh, earlier with the town to run sewers under Girl Brook. And, um, and I think the idea was, well, since they had sewers in there, that would be a nice place to put the um, sewage treatment plant. At that point, the trustees and the people in the neighborhood um, hired an attorney. There was an, uh, a, a legal opinion issued, which seems to have stopped the town, uh, but basically arguing that the trustees never had the um, power to transfer um, the land, given the terms that it had been set up they didn't have the power to transfer the land uh, to the college in the town back in 1913. Um, and therefore, the town had no claim on the land to build its sewage treatment plant. Um, and so um, it seems to be a well-established fact that if the Bellows Falls people are negotiating with Pine Park uh, for a flowage agreement, and by the way, Pine Park is the only owner along that stretch of river that has a commitment from the power company to restore erosion damage. And I know this makes the people in Lyme very envious. <laughs> um, and, uh, and finally, there was more damage to the park in 1985. Um, so the, the, what's been a, uh, in a recent history um, has been, uh, for one thing, the town gave a lot of permits to build in the upper Girl Brook watershed outside the park. And that meant, over time, more roofs, more driveways, paving of lot A uh, uh, over, uh, off the, um, over in that neighborhood, um, and the 2002 redesign of the golf course, the sort of cumulative effect of the development in the upper watershed and the 2002 redesign really posed an enormous problem for the park. And that was when I started to get concerned and finally got involved um, in trying to figure out why this was happening. Um, basically, the golf course design used Pine Park as, um, a, as a place to just channel its runoff. So we had the development of these huge ravines being gouged out of the hillside. Um, and in addition, we've started to get these 100-year rains every couple of years. And the soils in that area are particularly vulnerable to erosion because they're glacial soils. So they're, they're, they're easily, when they're disturbed, they easily start running down the hall and you could, hill. And you can see the consequences of that. And when you go, if you look at the outlet, there's a, now a sort of an island uh, in the middle of the cove. Uh, that didn't used to be there even 10 years ago. Um, 
at that point, uh, we get some studies going um, in 2005 and again in 2007. Unfortunately, the price tag for restoring the Girl Brook was a million dollars. And we and the town and the college thought that that was really excessive and not something that we could afford. So what we did instead was identify hotspots um, with the idea of trail uh, creating uh, a safer environment for trails. Because a lot of runners use the park, but so does the Hanover track team, so did the Dartmouth track team, the ski teams uh, run in there, um, people collect, uh, um, uh, conduct classes uh, in earth science and, and various other kinds of science. So it's a heavily used park and the safety of the trails was becoming a very real concern. What used to be very simple little fords over a few stepping stones um, had really um, deteriorated quite badly. So in addition to the hot spots and the town fixed a few of these, the college stepped up in a major way um, to fix a couple of the worst runoffs from several of the, of the um, upper um, holes on the east side of Girl Brook. Um, and then we basically, we also get the park included in the uh, study of erosion on, on the Connecticut River as part of the FERC application that TransCanada was making because its permit is up for renewal this year. Um, and then we um, had an operation. This is the construction of the Carolyn Tenney Bridge. I don't know if any of you remember Carolyn. She was very active in conservation issues in, in the town of Hanover. Uh, the trustees raised the money for this bridge, um, and the town uh, provided the labor and the equipment to do it. We also um, finally got um, a, 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 the worst erosion place um, fixed. So if you go, this is um, just below the su suspension bridge or the high bridge. Um, and the, I think the road from the 13th, hotel, 13th hole comes down here and it was flooding badly. The college fixed that last year and they just finished this bridge um, a couple of weeks ago. So we've dealt with two of the worst consequences from the years of uh, erosion. Um, but we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us. Um, we've had a forester come in and do an inventory for us. And basically, we have a lot of um, uh, invasive species. And they tend to come into the park where there's a boundary with the golf course. So. Um, we have, uh, still have safety issues of the trails, particularly along Girl Brook. We've got some erosion issues on the Connecticut Riverside. Um, the main thing is we've got these aging pines. And we're worried that pretty soon what we'll have is Hemlock Park or Maple Park. And uh, so we had an ecologist in to try to advise us about um, whether we should just let them come down as, they, as nature intended or whether we should intervene and maybe thin, thin, to thin them to make the, the strongest ones give them a better chance, whether we should be replanting in some of the bare areas where trees have now started to come down. But some of these trees, white pines are 125 years old and they're not gonna last forever. So that's a huge challenge for us. Um, and um, we need to address the access issues with the park because um, as Keith was saying, the, the uh, hikers and joggers um, don't necessarily mix very well with the golfers. And it's, you know, at one point I would sort of say, well, for more than 100 years, nobody's gotten hit in the head with a golf ball, but maybe it's just a matter of time. Um, one of the things that we, that the trustees have, are committed to is getting an updated survey of the property boundaries. Because when you look at the, um, at the different maps, so here's a map of the golf course. I think Keith had this one too. And, the, and it's hard to know whether it's the proportions, but Pine Park looks different to me here than it does in some of the other maps. So 
I happen to be on the uh, Golf Course Review Committee, and one of the issues that I've stressed with, uh, with my fellow committee members is let's just make sure we know who owns what um, before we get very far in this planning process. And so that's the sort of the first priority for the committee to just figure out well, what we have. But in the end, we have to solve the access issues as far as the park. And we think in addition, once we get an updated survey, then we can perhaps revisit the 1913 agreement with the town and the, and the college and develop some strategies to secure um, the future of the park for another 100 years. So here are some of the things that we might be dealing with. This is the, the high bridge. If you look, you can just see how this um, stream bed has just been gouged out. The, this is where the bridge is crossing now, but we have issues like that all along the Girl Brook and lots of downed trees. This is actually a pretty small one. But when the trees come down, they block the stream bed and then the water goes around and then it washes out more of the bank and more big old trees come down. So for now, I think it's wonderful that um, the Historical Society has taken the lead in focusing public attention on these two amazing resources that we have here in Hanover. And I want to thank you, Cindy, and your committee for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about something that we all love, we all take for granted. Everybody knows it's one of the gems of our community, and yet it needs help. It's not always going to it, it's, of course, it's going to change because it's a living thing. But um, some of the changes that are affecting it um, need to be remedied because they're man-made, not naturally made. So thank you for coming. And I guess Keith and I are going to do questions. Is that right? Uh, and some of you. So could you put the lights on now, please? OK. And we'll take questions. Um, I have a microphone, and we can pass it around, and you can, can speak and ask some questions. Thank you for listening so quietly and so well behaved. You're great. <laughs> um, first, I think we have Yes, thank you very much. Thank you both for excellent presentations. Uh, I'm curious about the extent to which Pine Park first, is okay. part of the uh, study that the college is doing about the future of the golf course. Is Pine Park also given equal treatment in that exercise or not? Well, I've made it very plain that my role on that committee is to be an advocate for the park. Um, and everybody seems to think that's a legitimate role. And I will be making a presentation before the committee. Um, it's simply a fact of life. They don't control Pine Park. So, um, but at the same time, there's been a real change of attitude on the part of town and college officials that has been quite dramatic in the last probably seven years, where they've really come to understand that they can't just do what they want with it and that it needs attention. So I, I don't think we're going to end up battling about this. But we'll see. I'm prepared to do battle if that becomes necessary. <laughs> I, that was uh, very interesting. Thank you. I used to live on Hockey Bridge when I was a kid. Oh, a nice. Good times in my park. Uh, clearly, the trees, the big trees are all the same age, so clearly that was a field at one point. Yeah. Do you know when that, when that was? Are there any old pictures of the field? I haven't found any, but that's exactly what the um, ecologist said on the, the shallow, the, the flat land that runs along the river. Um, since some of the oldest trees are about 125 years old, they must have been big enough in 1900 for the Diamond Match Company to want to cut them down. Um, but how big they were? Yeah, I'm surprised they're, they were older because 50 years ago, when I was a kid, they were pretty big trees. That's right. They would have been. So it's not the one thing about the forest is that it's kind of not really a, a climate. I don't know. That's not a bad term. They don't use that term anymore. But but it's because all the trees are the same age, it's it's, it's, kind of barking. it's not like it's also very vulnerable yeah. because of that. And and with and the trees are so big when they go, they'll take others with them. Um, we have a problem with deer in the park. Who doesn't? Who lives in that area? And so they don't eat the hemlocks. 
And um, so the hemlocks are getting a foothold in the park, but any sort of hardwood or whatever, when you walk through the park now, if you do, it's almost, com the understory is almost completely clear. Yeah, that's the trouble with hemlocks. Yeah, right, thanks. Do you want to Keith, you mentioned the gas station across the road, which was known as the Golf Side Gulf, and it was run by one Harold LeBounty. Uh, for the last more than 20 years, I've lived in the home of Harold LeBounty on Old Line Road, about halfway between Hanover and Lyme. One of the stories that I heard about Harold was that he kept a dog with him in the gas station. When a ball would land on the green across the road, he trained the dog to run across, pick up the ball, bring it back to the gas station where he sold them for 25 cents. <laughs> That's a good story. That was a recreational area. Wasn't there a bowling? Yes, a bowling. Now it became the mantra. Oh, perfect. Keith, Keith, in your earlier part of your presentation, you uh, uh, you suggested that the original incorporators you put it close to your mouth. The original incorporators uh, sold uh, the land and the rights to the course to the trustees. Was there any recorded restrictions on that sale? Uh, for example, uh, that it would be for the perpetual use of the. Town of Hanover residents or something of that nature? So I don't know whether there are any restrictions. I think one of my next projects is to go up to Grafton County and track down some of the, the deeds and transactions. But there's no mention that I can read of any restrictions. What, was it a, re a recorded document, do you think? I would assume so. I mean, it's, there was a price discussed. And, and there's a deed. So if there were restrictions, it would be in the deed. But I haven't seen the deed. Okay. Linda, which also brings up the interesting point is that the golf course, since it's owned by the college, almost everything the college owns is zoned I for institutional, whereas the um, whereas Pine Park actually is zoned, I believe, um, R for recreation, not NP for nature preserve because it's truly a recreational facility, but yes, everything the college owns. So it's sort of this interesting thing where we, we think of the golf course as being recreational, but technically it's, it's zoned institutional, which through our, um, our zoning law allows the college some leeway to support anything that's academic, purely academic in nature, to be built on I-zoned land, whether that is the BEMA, whether that is the Sweet Six there, whether it's other parts of the golf course that, that the college owns. So, um, but again, I, I think that there's been a change of heart in the past couple of years where the college and the town is very, um, very interested in preserving what most of us on the, um, most of us who are Pine Park trustees like referred to as Hanover's Central Park. <laughs> so. It's important, let me just add, it's important to also recognize that the golf, several of the golf course holes are actually on Pine Park land. Mm. Um, so if you think about Girl Brook doing this, these holes, pieces of them, are on Pine Park land. And all of hole five is on Pine Park land. And, hmm? as is the trestle bridge. So when the college wants to fix that bridge, they have to get our permission to bring equipment in there, which they did two years ago, and we were happy to cooperate with them. Our, we understand our mission is recreation. It's not lock up the woods and, and, and preserve it. The charge from the trustees is recreational, promote uh, outside activities. So, um, but we've, uh, so far we haven't found a record of when the course was expanded, who gave permission to put these holes on Pine Park land? Um, and that's one of the things we hope to accomplish when, if and when we get a survey, is to just figure out where exactly those boundaries are. 
you've got the mic, so far. Uh, the uh, riverbank is a hot issue these days right. uh, in line and other places too. Is it a problem along your bank? It is, and we've had some engineers look at it, and we've had the TransCanada people come out. Of course, it's not TransCanada anymore. Um, the new owner of the hydropower is apparently somebody who has a home in Hanover, and we, it, we've just discovered that, so we haven't talked to them. But um, they did some remediation on the banks in 1984, um, and it's required in the terms of the flowage deed. Um, and like everything else, you know, things get buried in the sands of time. And um, so we did um, get our park site uh, as part of the study uh, that was done for the permit. Um, but the results have, you know, they haven't been very forthcoming. And it's now, now that we have a new owner, it's something we have to get back to. We have some areas where um, the big trees are down and they're hanging above, just above the water. And the problem is, of course, um, you don't want them to come all the way out because they'll pull the bank with them. But you can't leave them there and you sort of can't get to them. And we don't have the money to do that. It's something that we wanted TransCanada to fix and they haven't. Their view is that it's not the dam rising and lowering the water that's causing the problem. It's the people who hardened their bank uh, upstream and on the opposites on the Vermont side uh, that's deflecting the currents now and hitting that part of our. Um, so we can fight about that in the meantime. Eventually, that bank will, it is, com it is coming away in places. We have another question. Should this be our last question, and then we can have refreshments and more discussion? Uh, I understand there's some new news about the golf course. Or is that not public information? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what it is. Tell. 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 Well, tell us what tell us. I know it's open it's open for two more years, and there's an anonymous donation to support it. A rather large donation. I understand there's more than one donor, and there already have been some funds allocated by another alum uh, to facilitate some planning. But what you've seen from Keith's wonderful history, this course keeps being redesigned and redesigned and redesigned because, in effect, um, it's still too short, despite what they did in 2002, for tournaments. Um, the men's golf team at Dartmouth can't host tournaments there. Um, and in fact, they usually play on the practice, I'm told by my students, they play on the practice course and then they might do a few holes um, on the main course. Um, so, it, I mean, how many times has it been rethought? Uh, from your account, I counted five. Yeah. Does that sound about right? Yeah. So we're going to rethink it yet again. Um, and um, there's some talk that um, it was interesting to me to hear about a new clubhouse and moving the Hanover in and whatever. I mean, it, it, nothing new under the sun. That's all I can say at this point. But everything, right now, everything is open and we're just really grappling with the issues of what is the, where are the boundaries and, what is the, and are there restrictions and things like that before we get into the pie in the sky. Okay, well thank you so much.